thank you everybody and welcome uh, to uh, to our, our webinar on multi-species. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us tonight uh, for what I hope is a, a beautiful evening in your part of the world. A um, bit of housekeeping first, we are recording this webinar so that we can send a copy out uh, for those that can't join us at this point. And also the same plea as we always make is please ask questions, please uh, tell us your experiences, what you've what you've found with multi-species, what you've liked about it, the animal performance, and, uh, and what's been difficult to manage. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is the first of a two-part uh, webinar. Next week on Thursday night, the seventeenth, we have we're joined by three farmers who are using multi-species on their own farm. Sam Chesney from Northern Ireland, who is the current uh, Farmers Weekly Grassland Manager of the Year. Um, Simon Bainbridge, who's organic farming up in Northumberland, many of you will know, who's predominantly beef and sheep, um, producing for Waitrose. And John Goodwin uh, from Radnorshire in Mid Wales, who is finishing beef and sheep, uh, and also studying for uh, an MSc in sustainable and efficient food production. So that's next uh, next Thursday, 7.30. Um, we'll email you if you've already signed up, but uh, it should be an interesting evening. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, the most species and uh, managing most species in your rotation. Um, Germinal have been developing mixed sward ideas and practices for over 15 years. So the first time I can remember it, we talk, started talking about chicory and plantain a long, long time ago. Um, and it has become very, very popular in the last sort of five years. Now, whether that's for um, plant biodiversity or soil structure or soil improvement, maybe for stewardship or for animal live weight gain, pure production, um, then we feel that multi-species with the right goalposts has a part to play uh, in modern farming. So tonight we've got Helen Matthews and William Fleming joining me. Uh, my name is Ben Wixey, and um, yeah, without that, any more ado, Helen, um, would you take over, please? Thank you very much, Ben, um, for that. Yeah, so um, multi-species, a bit on the background, and the the potential of mixed swords, it's it's widely acknowledged. Uh, they've been in use for many, many years, far longer than 15 years that, that we've been getting involved with them. Uh, so it, it's it's not entirely anything new at all, but there are plenty of evidence also to prove that um, you know multi-species swords can be adapted to many many farming situations. So um, we know that increasing species richness, so plant diversity uh, within a sward, can actually increase biomass, uh, the overall forage biomass. That's um, in low end situations. And, and as the plants all fit together, you've got this varying uh, leaf structure, uh, leaf angle, leaf shape, and so on. And so uh, both above and below ground, they capture more moisture. Above ground, they capture more, more light, more sunlight. And below ground, they're obviously capturing more soil nutrients. So all the plants fit together. And it's this sort of combination of, feature, uh, of, um, of species, along with the legumes that are nitrogen fixing, uh, and obviously grasses and herbs, nitrogen lifting, and we get this end fixation and in low end situations we can uh, uh, grow more more biomass potentially also the herbs and the legs legumes we get a greater growth during the the summer period usually so they cope with higher temperatures uh, they cope better with drought than grass do grasses do so we get a better growth during uh, the summer period or, or or in drought drought situations and and then um, because we're using, you know, if you're losing low, lower levels of nitrogen, it's a way to ensure that we've got we've got better yields by blending these three species of grasses and uh, herbs together. So now we know quite a lot about the properties of some of the individual species and sub, of subspecies. What we're really interested in going forward, we know far less uh, is understood in any great detail about how they fit together. Yeah, we understand the plant physiology uh, and the agronomy and so on. Um, but uh, what we want to know is how do they yield and how do they persist and what uh, effect do they have on animal intake? What's the animal intake potential and what's the quality like? So William's going to talk a little bit more about that. So we're doing some work down at the uh, Germinal Research Station and um, along with various colleges and, and institutions like that and indeed farmers talking to us uh, next week. So we're trying to develop a lot more information 
um, uh, to give us you know, that information that we need on um, how all these mixtures are, are gonna perform. Uh, I picked a few little bits of, of, of uh, information to, to demonstrate the uh, lamb growth, live weight gain and so on. This is, uh, you know, I mean, there are various scientific studies, but this one's uh, from the Smart Grass Project over in uh, Ireland at Dublin. Uh, where um, they've shown that um, in, in varying types of multi-species swords, uh, the simple six-species sword produce the most lamb live weight gain at the six-week stage. So the red bar there that you can see, that's just perennial ryegrass. The, red, the, the blue bar, perennial ryegrass and white clover. Uh, the green bar there is um, perennial ryegrass, timothy, white and red clover and plantain and chicory. And that produced more growth than a than a nine species sward, uh, with with you know more grasses and more more herbs in it. So that that's just one example. There are many. Um, here's uh, an example of some uh, on farm trials that we did um, at a college at, at Newton Rig in, in Cumbria, and the sward was actually our, our intensive sheep grazing mixture HSG three with white clover. And then on the other side, we've got uh, HSG3 with, um, with chicory. And um, there's a 41 day grazing trial and the lambs on the chicory side, they had um, a much reduced uh, or a reducing level of um, fecal egg counts there. You can see that's the, um, the numbers down the left hand uh, axis, the vertical axis there. So th there was, I have to say that um, there were very low parasite challenges anyway on these plots, but, but we still got a reduction in, in egg counts on the chicory side. And likewise, the lambs at the end of the 41 days, they'd, they'd put on more weight, they were closer to finishing, or they were finished, more of them were finished rather, and they use milk better and carried their, their condition score better. Um, the, another little one we did down here, and this was adding um, plantain to a similar mixture, the um, HSG3 type mixture. And over the four groups of lambs, uh, uh, comparing just grazing the grass and white clover with grass, white clover and, and, um, and plantain. Each group would show between 10 and 34% increase in live weight gain when we included uh, plantain in the diet. So those are just some of the experiences we've had and some of the science that's out there to, to demonstrate that, you know, adding a few more species or adding the herbs, uh, they're gonna get us a better, a better live weight gain, a better animal return. So, um, Looking um, simply at the sort of groups of species that we use. So these are our multi-species options. Basically, we're using grasses, uh, herbs and legumes. And um, I'm going to run through the, the top three boxes there. And they're all, uh, well, many of them are, but those are all native species to the UK. But they're all significantly improved for their agricultural use. So the performance is well known and proven. There are varieties that have bred to be uh, more successful and uh, you know, contribute to, to farming systems. So we already know that they are, sorry, that they're you know, widely successful out there. We know how to produce them, we know how to manage them. And uh, importantly, we're pr producing seed um, to very high standards of purity and germination. So they're well adapted to wide areas uh, of the UK. So just starting with the grasses, I'm sure ryegrass, perennial ryegrass really doesn't need any introduction, um, but essentially um, it's, it's the mainstay of a lot of multi-species or a certain percent of it, of it might be. And uh, it's for the obvious reasons in terms of, uh, you know, the high quality, the high intake potential, uh, very easy, rapid establishment, good yields, um, good seed yield as well, which is important to us and uh, good tolerance of, of all our management systems, grazing and mowing, very wear tolerance and so on. And uh, we can obviously formulate mixtures with all sorts of different ploidy and heading dates and so on. Um, another species, uh, very common grass species is Timothy. And, um, you know, that's very uh, persistent and dense. Again, it's uh, another sort of um, type of grass that we see frequently uh, in, in a lot of our mixtures. It tolerates harsher conditions, it tolerates wet ground better, it's very winter hardy, it's also very palatable to stock. Um, the only perhaps downside with, with, with Timothy is, is the very small seed and uh, it's slightly slower to establish, but again, you know, it's something that's very useful as another grass species within that mixed sward. Moving on to the, the herb group, the two main herbs, plantain and chicory, so they're our leading agricultural forage herbs. Um, 
they're moderately persistent. So they are perennial types. I say they're moderately persistent. They persist for about three, maybe four years, depending a little bit on the management and the conditions. They are very palatable, so they've good intake potential. Um, they're an excellent complement complement again to our other other pasture species. They grow well together because they have a similar competitive nature, capable of a good animal performance, as we've seen. Uh, don't really suffer from disease. They've got good disease and, and, and pest tolerance, don't attract um, any of the things that the brassicas might attract. And uh, they're high quality forage production in, in summer. Um, so they're ideal for finishing stock, finishing lambs and so on in midsummer. And uh, they do uh, produce well in a drought, in a very dry soils. So I wouldn't say you use them only in a drought because they are quite adaptable to all sorts of soil soil types and soil conditions. Uh, they're very high in minerals, high in tannins, and they have this ample minty property as we saw in reducing um, the worm burden. So the, the key differences between uh, the, the plantain and the chicory. So um, plantain's probably got a slightly better all year round production. So slightly earlier to get going in the spring and keeps growing slightly longer at the end of the summer. Uh, very high mineral profile, or both of these herbs. Um, slight difference between the two. Uh, again, we've mentioned the drought tolerance um, and exceptional animal performance, but particularly plant, uh, yeah, plantain is slightly easier to manage in that it doesn't bolt in the way that, um, that chicory can do. And you can see there, it has more of a, a fibrous sort of ball root. And just looking at the, the, the chicory here, Again, it's very high yielding and high in minerals and good at drought tolerance, but you can, you can see that uh, long tap root down there, which uh, that hole was about sort of 14 inches deep and you can see how thick the tap root is at the bottom. So uh, a different sort of type of root structure and a very long, very long tap root. The, 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 the difficulty, if you could call it that with, with chicory is the fact that when we get to sort of peak growth, it is very prone to bolting and it produces this um, tall woody stem, which, um, doesn't mow very well um, or it creates you know a lot of stalk that would be dis, uh, discarded it can puncture plastic and that sort of thing so it's not easy to manage if you're going to mow it we tend to uh, not put it in in multi-species mixtures that are for growing it's mainly for intensive and rotational grazing so those are the grasses and the uh, and the herbs the uh, legumes really clover red and white clover again they probably need no introduction whatsoever but they're very adaptable um, forages and widely used across the UK. So um, we'll know about nitrogen fixation and the different rooting type from the red and the white clover with either the tap, tap root and the stoloniferous growth. They're very good at building store for tip, uh, um, soil, um, yeah, building soil fertility, enhancing, enhancing that soil structure. They have a very high uh, feed quality, uh, not just in terms of protein, it's a true protein. Uh, it's not the fast fermentable type of protein that um, uh, that's highly fermentable in the room and it's a bypass protein more used to the animal uh, so it has very high intake potential so it's a, a natural source of homegrown forage protein obviously if you're using legumes and you've got that nitrogen fixation going on your requirement for chemical nitrogen for inorganic nitrogen is a lot less that's helping reduce your, your greenhouse gas impact um, uh, you know your carbon footprint on farm and legumes like the herbs, they have that waxier leaf, that deeper rooting structure. They cope with higher temperatures and tired and uh, high, uh, drier soils than grass. And you can see on the left there also, um, you know, those flowering heads, they're very uh, important to um, pollinators. Um, red clover, just quickly, very high yields, as we know, uh, modern, more persistent varieties and widely used in lots of different scenarios, uh, both with uh, grass or even some straight stands that we see. Um, they do, you know, there's plenty of information showing that they do improve animal returns, so milk yield, live weight gain, and so on, new condition. Uh, so we've got modern varieties now that persist for uh, up to five years. The only thing with red clover is to bear in mind the management of both, both legumes, really. We need to think about bloat with them, but also red clover particularly, it uh, needs um, a five-year rotation to stop a buildup of um, the soil-borne pests and diseases like sclerotinia and stem nematode. White clover, I'm sure, will be familiar to, familiar to very many of you. And again, it's a great complement to, to the mixed swords, uh, both with other legumes and herbs. Different growth to the red clover, different growth habit. Uh, and it, it's highly suitable for grazing because of that stoloniferous growth. Um, 
red, white clover and like the red clover the white clover comes in different leaf sizes from small to medium to large and each each you know uh, leaf size group would have a, a tend to have a slightly different purpose but again we can blend those together and we'll fill in different areas they can do different things in that multi-species sward for us Here's an example of that uh, that picture in the background. I don't know how clearly you can see that, but that's an example of a, a typical multi-species swords with two grasses, two clovers, and, and the two herbs exactly that we've said. Uh, so perennial ryegrass, Timothy, um, red and white clover, and then a plantain and chicory in that mixture there. It's on um, real Oxfordshire uh, uh, dry, brashy soil where grass growth in the summer um, sort of well slows right down so there's a need there this was in an arable rotation and uh, maintained its productivity and you know finishing lambs throughout the summer when the grass probably wouldn't have done uh, just a, a few quick pointers on 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 management things to be aware of uh, mixtures do change over a period of time this is some work that was done in um, in uh, northern ireland with trevor gilliland where mixtures sort of there we've got some um some uh, coxfoot and lucerne and very other types of grasses in there and you can see that after three years the dominant species have, have taken over the sword completely you can't find any more of those uh, lesser competitive species and so there's one example there with four species and the one on the right there was actually six species in it but the two competitive species are what are left what is left after you know uh, the, by the third year um, and the, the reason that happens is because they all have a relatively uh, a relative competitive ability. So if you look at uh, perennial ryegrass, and um, we know that that's quick and easy to establish. All right, tetraploids are sort of quicker and more aggressive than uh, than diploids, and and they will grow and they'll be reasonably uh, productive in the first year. By the time the lay is four years old, those perennials, obviously that's perennial ryegrass, they're still there uh, and they're still reasonably competitive. So red clover and white clover, though they're less competitive at establishment quite competitive during the first year and then red clover its competitive ability decreases whereas the competitive nature of the white clover with the stoloniferous growth that actually increases so all the different species that we use they vary in their their degree of competitive nature establishment and then in their first year and then you can see we get down to some of the smaller herbs and legumes and they are really not very competitive at establishment and uh, you know they, they struggle when they're alongside the more competitive uh, plants to establish and, and uh, you know take over a valuable part of the sward. William's going to cover that in a little bit more detail with you, but you know there's a way of putting a multi-species together that can produce both live weight gain and animal performance. You know with those productive agricultural types that we were we were just referring to there. Uh, I've just got a couple of points about establishment and then about management. So um, we'd say soil pH of six and above, or certainly for those, uh, you know, three types that I've actually covered there. Obviously, there are some uh, species that would prefer slightly more acidic or even more, um, uh, more alkaline types of soil, but generally around six for those grasses, legumes and herbs. P and K is important for establishing from all of them, and they have certainly the legumes will have quite a high demand for for potash, for K, but that can obviously come from, from muck and so on. Um, you wouldn't really use N or very small amounts of N other than um, organic muck. And that could be maybe if you're using it, it'd be in, in say in an arable rotation where you've got a spring sowing and you're trying to give the grass a bit of a, a lift in the first instance, but generally speaking, very little or no N at all. And that would only be its establishment. The key thing, all of these um, species that we're talking about, well, most of them, not all of them, but most of them are very, very small seed. So we need nice shallow drilling. It's, it's literally, it's five, certainly no more than 10 mil in the surface. If you can work up a nice fine tilth and drill them into the surface and then roll and, you know, press them in. Controlling weeds, uh, we would try and create maybe a stale seed bed or a nice clean seed bed be before we start. And uh, whether that's cultivate, whether that's drilled or broadcast, there's no particular preference. You might cross drill. Some people would argue that broadcasting gives each plant a little bit more space than time to direct drill them where you put them in a slit. And it's, you know, there's quite a lot of competition when you've actually got them all in the same line. The key things, though, are this fine, firm, uh, clean seabed drilling into the surface and a warm soil. So they need a warmer soil than than your yeah, average sort of grass lay. Um, so you'd be looking at this year, it would have been early May before we reached that temperature, sort of soil temperature. You really need a cutoff for 
I would say mid-August to get them drilled. Otherwise, the plant just hasn't had the opportunity to build up enough um, of a root biomass, a root network to cope with. Uh, as we saw last year, we had very wet soils in October and then it went very, very cold. And any late drillings, though we had a very nice warm September, it got very wet and very cold very quickly. And late sown uh, legumes struggled as a result of that. A um, few little points on management and um, um, might, depending really on when you sow, you might be uh, grazing it very lightly in the first autumn. So, um, you know, once that, that uh, those plants have passed the, the pull test, once they're well enough established for you to go and try and sort of rip the top off without uh, uprooting them in any way, they're well anchored, then you can go in and start some light grazing, nipping, nipping the top off. Ideally, rotationally or block grazing or your back fencing, so stock can't go and, um, uh, and nibble at any of the regrowth. And obviously that's assuming that the soil will, will take the stock on it, that you're not doing more damage by trying to graze it. Uh, the um, first cut normally when we've got legumes and herbs, first cut normally would be around the um, third week in May uh, to the end of the, uh, yeah, to about the end of the first sort of week in June. That would be a normal cutting time. Obviously, if you've sown in the summer, you might be taking um, a cut in September. So we don't really want to go into winter with high covers on, um, but it, it will be worth, you know, taking it off. And if it's a sort of, a, a, say you're sowing a sward now, it might be an opportunity mowing it in, in late August or early September to take some annual weeds out with it if, if that's what's come. So either mowing or light grazing of the regrowth. Things to remember, are, please don't try and mow it too low. Uh, we must avoid damage to the crown, both by cutting and grazing. But if you can leave that sort of, um, you know, three to four inches, seven to 10 centimetres, that's the ideal uh, height if you're going in with a mower. And then, uh, annually if the plant gets a chance to flower then obviously when it's when it's um getting a putting a flower head up putting a seed head up then all the energy is going back down to the root so you're building your root reserves for the summer so um i'm going to hand over to william that's my last slide and uh, i don't know if there's any questions now ben or whether we're going to carry on um yeah just uh, if you could unshare if you can helen's updated her zoom software and uh, was struggling with it a minute ago, but um, Liam, if you can take over now. Uh, Helen, one, one question's come in. Can you stitch uh, multi-species herbs into existing grass lays? I would, uh, it needs to be very, very bare and a very, very open sward. Generally speaking, we've had the most success with a completely new seed bed. Um, so pro probably not. It's better, it's better if you've got a clean seed bed. Okay. Um, Helen, I think we've got a technical issue. I think your uh, computer is still dominating the, the, the output because yeah. I don't think William can share his screen by the looks of no, things. No, can at the moment, no. And what we're, what we're seeing is your desktop picture. Yeah. So perhaps if you can log out altogether, it should enable I'll William to... I'll be back. I'll be back, <laughs> okay. Arnie in the corner there. Bye. Um, all right. Give it a few, few seconds for that to disappear. There you go, William. Can you now share your screen for us? Yeah, I'll just get organized. Okay, that the, the multi-species option slide up there, Ben. It is, yeah, yeah, spot on, yeah. Great, well, good evening, everyone. And um, in this se session, I'm going to follow on from Helen, who's talking about these main species, which we, we know a lot about, and we understand really well. And um, some of the ones in these bottom boxes that we're going to be discussing, we do understand, but we don't have the same depth of knowledge on them as what we have in those top species. There we go, we're moving on. Yep, we'll start off in the grasses. We'll start with the coxfoot there. This is a really versatile grass, a fantastically versatile grass because it stands dry weather and dry conditions really well. But as well as that, it's able to tolerate standing in wet conditions and wet ground. But one of the things that we must say about this grass is that palatability really depends on aggressive grazing management. You've got to keep it grazed really down tight um, 
to keep the leaf strong, to keep them, the protein there and to keep them nice and succulent because once they get um, larger and slightly more mature, they start to become unpalatable. There's a kind of silicon hair on the back of them. And when a cow wraps her tongue around about them, those sharp silicon hairs jag it and they reject it. And when they reject it, it starts to get more clumpy. And the less that it's grazed, the clumpier it gets. And the only way to reset that is to mow it, to take it down and keep it grazed really tight. And that's the only way you're going to keep this grass, which is very versatile and useful in certain situations, palatable for stock. Looking on to the fescues, one of the things I've discovered, there are over 300 different species within the Festuca family, from the very specific lawn types to varieties that can grow to more than two metres tall. The uh, top picture is one, a um, meadow fescue there, and then the bottom one is Aber Charm, which is one of the creeping red fescues that we use in the amenity side of our business. The main ag species for um, of fescue, of Fescues is meadow fescues, tall fescues, and some sheep's fescues. They're lower yielding than perennial rye grasses, but they still have a reasonable quality and a reasonable energy content there for the stock. At this point, I think we would like to mention a uh, fesculoleums. There's a, a lot of interest within the agricultural community about fesculoleums at the moment, but the thing to remember about a fesculoleum is the parentage of it, to understand what um, the fescue part of the parentage is and what the, the perennial ryegrass part of it is so that you know how it's going to react within your certain situations. We've currently just this year had um, a fesculoleum aber root get onto the recommended lists and hits a cross between an atlas fescue and a perennial ryegrass and the, the atlas fescue from North Africa obviously it does really well in dry conditions so about had a limited amount of seed, which we're getting out onto um, 30 farms this year to try and test it in dry situations and see how it reacts um, to, to prove that it does as well as we think it will. And hopefully within two years, we'll have it into uh, some of our commercial mixes. Moving on to some of the herbs, we're going to Yarrow. It's more suited to poorer soils and dry conditions as it's very deep rooted. Um, we're looking at a tap root going down into the soil there. Um, it's claimed to have several medicinal purposes as a tonic for stomach disorders and claimed to aid the hormonal balance and fertility. Um, all of these things are anecdotal claims that we wouldn't hang our hat on. Um, one of the things to remember about yarrow is it's a very, very small seed. Helen was mentioning that just a moment or two ago. But yarrow, for instance, has about nine and a half million seeds per kilogram. So we'd only add a full rate between 100 and 200 grams an acre um, on, of yarrow to a, seed, to a seed mixture. Burnet, this one, one of the faster establishing herbs, so it's able to compete slightly better with your aggressive perennial ryegrasses and your aggressive white clovers. It has a tap root again, which goes down to about a meter and a half. It prefers to work in um, drier soils with a relatively low fertility. It doesn't like wet, heavy clay soils. It really struggles in these situations. So that's one of the things that we want to kind of get over to tonight is the fact that all of these herbs in this bottom section, they're very specific for where they're going to work. Um, they're not, they don't have the widespread um, general use that we'd have from the herbs and the legumes that Helen was talking about a moment or two ago. William, can I, can I, William, can I just interrupt you there? We've got a question in from George on this topic. Um, yarrow grows easily on their on their clay soils. What is the agricultural importance of yarrow? I know you've just been through it, but um, do you want to say anything about the, the quantity of yarrow, the production that it that it gives? Well, well, there's a slide coming later on, Ben, with um, some of the research that we're doing down at a research station in in Wiltshire, and that will show you the impact. One of the problems with things like yarrow is that, yes, the quality is good, but it's getting enough of it within the, the diet and within the sward to have a big impact on the, the, the overall diet that we have within for the stock layer. And that's one of the challenges um, with some of these um, herbs that are in this bottom line of boxes that we're talking about. They're small seeds, they're in a small amount. So 
I, I think I'd like to see a wee bit more about that when I get, get to the slides okay. later on, if that's okay. Um, now, where was it? Um, keeps partially levels on to, yeah. This, was, this is naturally high in iron and vitamins A and C. And again, it's another plant with a deep tap root that goes down to about two metres. This high vitamin and iron content, it's useful as a medicinal plant again and can aid in fertility, but it doesn't tolerate hard grazing. So these are the problems that we have with some of these herbs is the hard grazing and the, the aggressive grazing that we have in some of the rotational grazing situations. And it's worth remembering where you want to place these herbs into slightly, perhaps less aggressively managed swords. Moving on, we're going to bird's foot trefoil here. This is a persistent perennial um, that has a well-developed deep tap root, but as well as this deep tap root, it also has lateral roots near the surface. And as a, as a legume, it actually creates more biomass than a lot of your other legumes. It's suited to, excuse me, lower, moderately fertile soils, but benefits from readily available phosphorus. I mean, it can grow down to pH 5.5 and up as high as 7.5. So it's very flexible in terms of the, the pH. It's highly palatable, but it is slow to establish and it doesn't fare well in comp competition. And one of the things to remember if it's been grazed is burst root trefoil doesn't replenish its root stores through the year at the same way a grass does. So it needs to have green leaf there to photosynthesize and keep it going. So hard rotational grazing doesn't work. The best management practice for this is always to maintain some green leaf during the grazing season and then allow it to rest between September and mid-October to allow those root stores to replenish their energy for the following season. And I know that can be a challenge as at that time of year in a lot of farms, grass growth, grass growth is beginning to tail man for it there with ewes going to the top or so, that sort of thing. So it can be a challenge being able to maintain the bird's foot trefoil in those situations. Black may another one that we have included in some of the, the herb packs. When this is a, a an immature plant, it grows close to the ground, but as it matures and as it establishes, its growth becomes more upright and can get as tall as 15 centimetres when it's ungrazed or is mature. And once it's established, it does develop a tap root again but it doesn't like waterlogged soils. It does better on light free draining. A relatively fertile soil established to survive through that first winter. Um, and it, it, so, sorry, it doesn't, it struggles. Um, I lost my train, train of thought there. It struggles when it's competing in a sward with some, with red clover in it, as the red clover overshadows it and um, it, it competes it. Crimson clover, this is a very short-lived one, not winter hardy at all. It has been sown in the spring into a warm seed bed. But one of the areas we see this being used is it's used, often used as a nurse crop for organic, organic grass reseeds. And in this sort of situation, it can produce between three and four tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And again, it prefers lighter type of soils. Veggies. These we would normally add to between four and eight kilograms an acre in a mix as it's a large seed. It's one of the largest, largest seeds we have there. And in a pure stand, you would put it in it between 30 and 35 kilograms on it. If you sow it in the spring, you're able to cut it and graze it that same year. And then depending if it's on its own or what other companion crop, if you want, um, forage will come in at about 20% protein. And it has been estimated that um, veggies will fix in the region of between 100 to 250 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, very similar to white clover, but it doesn't have the persistency. Um, it's only the winter veg that will last through that first winter. Lucerne, I'm not going to say much about Lucerne tonight as we had a webinar on that um, in early April, and there's a recording of that available to watch back if Lucerne is something that you're very interested in on our website. Um, it's a fantastic forage crop, and that's one. The only thing I'm going to emphasize here is for Lucerne, we need free draining soils and a good pH of over six and a half. But if you want to learn more about it, go to our website, and the webinar from that will be available to watch back. 
uh, if that's of interest. Sandfoin, this is another um, legume that likes free drain and alkaline type soils. It does really well up in the likes of the Cotswold brash type soils. Um, it's slower to establish. So if we were sowing it, we would sow it with a companion grass of something like a made of fescue or a coxfoot for grazing, as these are slower to establish and therefore they'll come away at the same sort of time. But if you get it established, it'll persist for between um, seven to 10 years. And it's worth considering uh, inoculating the, the seed to get the right mycorrhiza there to ensure nitrogen fixation. A little bit about mixes now and mixtures. Some of these herbs have specific uses in specific areas. And um, this is the multi-species grazing mix that we have. It consists of low mix at top row because they're consistent uh, across a wide range of soil types and across a wide range of management practices. And we know what they can do. So that's why we've tended to stick with these um, plants and species within this sort of mix. The cutting multi-species mix here, the major difference is the exclusion of chicory. Um, as Helen said, when chicory goes to seed, it's up that lignified, um, very woody seed head, which damages plastic and is very unpalatable. So that's why we've left that out of it, um, because it's not going to fit in with the heading dates when you're wanting to be cutting silage. We've included vetches here and fixation clover. Um, these are there for yield in that first season and also to provide protein content in that first year's, first year silage, and they will die out over that first winter. And by that time, the, the white clover and the red clover will be well, be well enough established that they'll be able to supply the yield and the protein content in subsequent years. The herb pack that we can include here, um, either with or without the, the chicory and the plantain in it, we've talked about these herbs. It's about knowing where they're going to be beneficial and where they're going to work and where they're going to establish and how you're going to manage them. These are things that you really need to think about and talk to your seed merchant about to try and understand where they are. And because they're um, smaller seeds and more difficult to get seed from, they tend to be more expensive to try and acquire as well. One area that we have been focusing on is our stewardship mixes. Um, we have all the information sheets for these different mixes that we have available on the website as well. Um, and through our amenity colleagues, we have access to a wider range of specialist uh, species that we don't have the capacity to, but we don't have the capacity as a company to mix the, the cereal based options for the stewardship mixes. We tend to focus, we focus on these small seeded ones. But one of the things we'd say, and I always say to anybody that asks is we would recommend that you get the specification for what's actually in the mix and clarify it and pass it with your um, regulator, be that DEFRA or your local authority area where this scheme covers to make sure that it passes the specification and is acceptable to them before you go ahead. Um, it's a complicated area. And as things, subsidies are changing with the phase of the move away from the direct payments to ELMS, this is something that we are going to have to and are focusing on to make sure that we try and make sure and tailor our mixes going forward to meet the requirements of these. But currently we don't have an awful lot of detail on it. And it's something what we're watching, um, watch this space as it develops, shall we say. Moving on, just to say a little bit about the, the continued research work that General as a company are continuing to do at a research station. This is a variety of different multi-species um, mixes that were shown in the plots there. Um, and this picture was taken just prior to the first cut on the, the 14th of July. And that was about 12 weeks post drilling. They were then cut again as a simulated grazing on a rotational basis every 21 to 28 days after that. Um, to try and understand the yields and also some of the quality aspects of these different mixes. There's a lot of information in this slide and I'm not going to go through all of it, but what it's really there to do is to show you that we took all the, the samples, we botanically separated them, which was a big job for 
the team at the research station. In fact, after they tried it to begin with, they called in um, the ag sales team to go down and give them a hand to try and separate it out. So anybody that's watching tonight and wants a fancies a job, give us a shout. None of us particularly enjoy standing over these trees trying to separate all, all these species. Uh, and you're more than welcome to come along and see the work that goes on in doing this. Because we, to get these MEs and crude proteins that you see there, we need to get at least 30 grams dried. Um, so you can see there that alcite, black meric is all in one. Well, those had to be combined because there was so few of them within the, the sample. And that's what the qu relates back to the question that Ben was asking earlier. It, there are a small amount of them, and this next slide will show that when you see the, the component parts of the different very, very small. So, them, so it's how much of that quality, which is good in a lot of instances, will that be able to contribute to the sword? So that's why we're continuing to trial these, these mixes. We're monitoring the compositional changes of them year on year. And we're also monitoring them under different fertilizer regimes and different frequencies of cutting or different frequencies of grazing um, so that we can tailor mixes and try and put together they're going to be persistent and continue to work. Um, as well as doing it at the research station, we're also getting some of these, the same mixes that we've got here, we're getting them out onto, uh, we've got them going in, this, going in this year to a couple of um, the universities across the country to try and replicate this work to give us figures back and also give us some data back on animal performance. Um, so for, for low, low multi-species has been talked about for a long time, we're continuing to do more and more work on it to try and learn more about it and learn more about the impact that it has on livestock and the performance of that livestock so that we can put out the best possible mixes to use farmers to help you going forward. Um, and just in summary, as the site says, the slide says, the rules are very site specific. It depends what works on your land. And that's one of the things that we're going to learn from this replicated work at the universities is we're going to learn what establishes um, in the northeast of England against a site in Wiltshire and then a, there's another site in Cheshire, hopefully, and we'll see the differences in terms of establishment and hopefully get data then from um, a, the, the animal performance and be able to get data on the reliability of these things before we go forward. Um, and that really sums everything up at the moment. I'd just like to say thank you all very much for your participation tonight. As Ben said, uh, we can Thursday night, sorry about that wrong, it's a Thursday the 17th, um, we'll have our next one with the farmers there. We'll just hand back to you now, Ben. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a few questions come in. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first one perhaps is probably for me. Are, are we breeding plantain and chicory? Um, at the moment, there's no plan to breed or select chicory. Uh, but we have started a plantain selection program down at the research station uh, and, and, and involving Ivers. We uh, believe there is benefits um, to it and there is more potential to come from different varieties. So that, that is something that's in the pipeline. Um, what else have we got? Question from Darren. Uh, Tannins mentioned, uh, can you explain the relevance in this scenario? Does anybody want to take that? I think they're just compounds that um, um, uh, attach to proteins, aren't they? they? Stop the protein breakdown. So in this in this role, they'll be helping prevent bloat primarily. So birds foot trefoil and, and to a certain extent, some of the herbs are going to help bloat prevent bloat with the legumes from the legumes. Yeah, yeah. And we had um, a couple of years ago, we bought back some plants from Argentina, which were massive, great birds foot trefoils with. Uh, huge amounts of um, tannin in them and we thought we were onto something uh, with the breeding program in terms of breeding those into le other legumes uh, but unfortunately they haven't survived a second winter there. so um, it, you know if the plant doesn't survive it's it's, it's little pur uh, pur purpose going forward with it 
Um, what options to reduce the weed burden uh, with the herbicide reduction? You guys talk about that for a minute. There's very, very little, next to nothing. That the, yeah, there's, there's no herbicides. These weeds are going to be very susceptible to all of the, the herbicides that are there. So you're, you're either going to be um, trying to get a, a clean seed bed beforehand um, whether that's a stale seed bed and killing out ever, the weeds beforehand or grazing it lightly to get some of these things down or topping it in that first year. Um, I think, Meister, have you anything else to add to that, Helen? No, I think it's it, it's it's mechanical or, or, or management methods. There are no there's no uh, there's no spray that you can really use unless you're prepared to um, spot spray. Um, you know, any 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 really sort of injurious things like docks or thistles, you, you, you might have a gut, but I think it's it's management and it's about getting that good quality sward, isn't it, as dense as you can to um to try and make sure they're out competing any 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 weeds really. Uh, but a stale seed bed might help. Um yeah. No. Ros has asked in, in a continuation that Ros has asked if whether you uh, would get that flush of weeds after you've worked a seed bed and if you use something like thistle X, I I'm not uh, basis qualified so uh, I can't really comment but if you'd use something like Fisilex uh, how long would you have to leave it before you drilled in um, a multi-species lay? Oh, I don't I, I don't think you can do for a while I, I, I like I can't remember what they are and I'm basis qualified but I, I'd have to check the label and all the rest of it but I think right. your only recourse really is a stale seedbed and, and something like Roundup yeah. And then, uh, you know, but literally at the very pre prepare your seed bed, you get your flush of weeds and they're barely, they're very, very small. They're cotyledons and maybe a few true leaves. And then you take them out and then you drill in. So th th they're very small weeds when you take them out with a very low dose of Roundup, really. But as that was what we'd mean by a, a stale seed bed. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, question from Anna. What height do you go in at uh, to get the most efficient grazing? <laughs> you can have a whole difference of opinion in this one. Um, they're very difficult multi-species swords um, to plate me because of the, the difference of it. Um, so you would, I would suggest somewhere between kind of two or three inches above your ankle is the where you would look to go. Or if you want to get some more mature things then you leave them longer. But to get the most efficient, and the, the time to go in and graze is actually going to change as the season goes on because um, chicory, for example, at the height of the summer, at this time of year and into July, when it's grown really vigorously, your rotation length is going to shorten um, round about it. Otherwise, it goes to seed quickly. So if you've got to be flexible in how you plan your rotations and these swords to, to get them at the right level before they get too strong. Question from Mike, who I believe Mike, this is Mike, there's an old college mate of mine from down at Silhain. Um, have you any data on grazing residuals and persistency? Well, I think, William, you've just covered it there, really, that, you know, the, the, the lower you take it, the more damage you do to some of these um, delicate crown plants and, uh, and you won't have the persistency. How long in general would you two say a multi-species sward should last? How long would you, would you budget it to last on the farm? Shall I go, will you? Yeah, go on. I think, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you have a good this one. Well, yeah, I mean, three to four years, but people are using these sorts of mixtures now, things like GS4, and they're accepting the fact that after two and a half, two and a half to three years, you've probably got to top some things up. And, and having just said that you can't over-sow them, it, it, it's very difficult. So depending on what species you're using uh, will dictate the, the, you know, the persistence, the length of the life of the lay. But I... I think you should be looking for a minimum of three good years. The species might change a little bit in that time, but I would say three full years. I don't know whether William would think they might be a little longer than that. No, I would I would agree three to four years. And I mean, as Helen's slide showed there from the work at um, AFB, how the, how the composition of the sward changes. And it's to do with the management of the sward and the ground conditions. That's how what's going to have the biggest effect on the first day of it, and graze these um, plants with a, a, a crown weight conditions and too hard and you need that crown, then you're, you're, you're reducing your persistency considerably. 
because that the, the, the rain's going to get in and they're going to rot. So it's it's management as well as the um, impact on persistency. Okay. A uh, question from Richard. Any issues with palatability of plantain or chicory? I'll, I'll, Helen, do you want to go on this one? Because otherwise the two of you can't work out how to answer it. Uh, uh, plantains very palatable. I mean, allow, allow you know, stock to, to adjust themselves to it over a period of time, as you would do with any change of nutrition. Once they get used to plantain, they should keep eating it. Chicory can definitely at certain times go through an unpalatable stage and sometimes it takes them a little bit longer to get used to actually eating it but we have found instances of people say they're not eating the chicory and then sort of conditions change um, and it becomes more more palatable again but a lot of it is the is the growth stage or the height of the plants when you present them to the animals so you know you're looking for them to for want of a better expression sort of look nice and palatable so that's that as William was saying that kind of sort of eight inches probably in height when they're nice and leafy a little bit like the pictures where you know you saw them down at the GRS there where you've got something that that you know it, it sort of looks like a nice palatable salad if that makes any sense um but that so so when when they're when they're young and they're leafy their intake potential and their quality is a lot higher than if you let them get stronger and you'll start to see you know color change in the leaf the leaf will go sort of a darker color and you'll start to get a lot of sort of woody stems and things and then they will lose uh, the palatability and their intake potential as well. And the, also the, um, you know, the quality of the nutrition. That might answer another question a little bit further down as well, Ben. Mm. Okay, Howard's replied. Howard. Can I just add to that a wee bit, ben? Oh, Yeah, go, sure, of course. I would just like to add to that and just say that um, that's dead right, but when you're transitioning stock on, particularly with chicory in it, it getting them on when it's aye, short and leafy, and that's the, 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 the best and easiest way to transition them on to it. If you leave them in inches to that slightly more bitter stage and more mature stage, it's harder to get them to start. Or once you get them started and adapted to cherry, and personal experience has shown me in the past, they really do very well on it and they will continue to go back to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Howard. Howard Mason from Crop Advisors has, has given us the answer on Thistlex. Uh, there is a six week gap between spraying and sowing. Do not sow kale, swedes, turnips, or grass mixtures containing clover by direct drilling or minimum cultivation within six weeks of applying Thistlex. So thank you for that, uh, uh, Howard. Um, do we have any ABBA root seed available? Um, the short answer is no. Um, we had uh, a small quantity of seed which we have uh, allocated up to about 30 farmers who replied to a questionnaire we put out on social media looking for drought situations I think William alluded to um, but the ABBA route has got onto the recommended list this uh, this spring and therefore is a quality grass better than the other grasses that are on the recommended list in its group at this moment and therefore uh, we will be multiplying up the, the seed production but that takes two or three years because we support the recommended list we won't produce big quantities of, of grass seed until we know it's on that list um, so now that we know it's on we'll ramp up the production drilling this summer uh, harvesting next summer so that would be available for sale the, the year after uh, and we'll also by then have much more idea on the um, uh, benefits of ABBA root, the festilodium, the perennial long-term festilodium in um, in drought or waterlogging situations. Okay, um, right, uh, William, um, a lot of the herbs that we talked about, and I think you did cover this, are, are, um, uh, are, are to be grazed lightly um, how does this how does this work in with the GS4 uh, if you're going to use these mixtures in a GS4 stewardship scheme? Um, well, you may be going to list, and earlier there in one of our answers that the GS4 uh, mixes a lot of people are having to re them after two two and a half years or top them up. Um, they are a part of a scheme that you're in. So you get paid for that scheme. So they're not something that you're going to be able to graze as intensively um, as you would in a normal situation. 
So you have to back off your stocking rates to get the persistency there. Otherwise, that plants will have to be replaced in your GS4 quicker, if that makes sense to that. Okay. Uh, Does that make sense to what? You're breaking up a bit, William. I'm not sure if it's my internet connection or yours. Um, question here. I see in New Zealand uh, farmers establishing herbs and clovers in year one to improve soil structure and fertility and direct drilling perennial ryegrass in in years two and three and farming in a conventional way from then on. What do we think about that? My instant response to that is that they have herbicides in New Zealand that are not available to us to control some of the more aggressive and broadleaf weeds that we suffer with. Um, but it's a, it's a novel idea. Um, so you guys have any... Yeah, one of the local colleges we're doing, would are sowing clover and then going to establish grass in it afterwards. Uh, I've, I've never seen it done, so. Um, in theory, it would work, wouldn't it? Because you'd, the yeah. perennial ryegrass plant that you stitch in ha would have a better chance of establishing in year two or three than, than the clover or herb. Uh, it's whether you could get that first year crop clean enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so Darren said, uh, should we be taking a different management approach with these types of lays, less intensive, more holistic, extended grazing rounds with higher residuals, uh, residuals, sorry, including soil health as part of the change away from intensely managing swords? Helen, do you want to? Uh, well, I think I think to a certain extent that that is starting to go on. You know, I mean, we're not saying, and nobody's trying to say that you go multi-species across all your forage-producing area. I think it, it's it's you know, there's 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 roles for multi-species um, in arable rotations. You know, there's a lot of talk about improving arable soils by using multi-species swards to improve the soil quality and and build up soil carbon, soil biomass, uh, so, um Org organic matter in soils and so on. So I think it's, it, it, it's, it's not the one solution, it's part of the solution and it's something that we can do a lot more of. And I think most farms could find an area to do some of it. How much of it, you know, um, depends on your, on your farming system and what you're doing. But yeah, definitely it, it needs to be talked about in the, in the, in the context of it. You know, we, we've got to think about these and manage these in, in a different way to, how we've been intensively managing, you know, traditional, if we can call them traditional sort of yeah. um, um, farms, farming systems. Yeah. And, and I think that's uh, quite a, a, an important message that we that we kind of want to get across with these multi-species swords. It's, it's, it's horses for course, isn't it? Know what your goalposts are, know what you're trying to use your multi-species lay for, whether it is soil structure or, or soil health or livestock production and then grow the, the crop that suits that sort of scenario. Uh, I think we will wrap it up there for tonight. Thank you everybody very much for attending and, and, and staying to the end. Uh, can I just promote the open days, the face-to-face -face open days, the farmer talks, the farmer meetings are uh, back on. We are starting with three in July, one in Hlandilo on Wednesday the 14th, one in uh, Endon in Staffordshire on Wednesday the 21st of July these are and one in Midlothian on Tuesday the 27th just a chance to get out and meet people again uh, obviously you need to register if you could go to the Germinal website if you're interested in any of those walks and just uh, in the search bar type in farm walk registration so that we can uh, notify you if we do need to cancel at the last minute um, but uh, Thank you very much for your time, everybody. I think uh, there are a couple of questions and points that uh, we haven't covered, um, which we will um, which we will get to. Um, Jan Vicente, uh, you're on the Isle of Wight. Could you message me afterwards? Because when I stop this program, I don't, I can't see your chat. Um, so if you could message me, that would be great. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next. Uh, Thursday it is not Tuesday as it says there on the screen Thursday the 17th of June for the webinar with the three farmers using multi-species uh, year on year. Thank you very much everybody for attending. <laughs>